trackers of truth as always let's begin with our trackers prayer T teach me your truth R reveal to yourself to me through your word and spirit you unite my heart to yours T transform my life to be like Jesus H help me to follow you our trackers pledge in every area of my life I pledge to track down truth in God's Word walk in truth by following Jesus and live in truth through the power of the Holy Spirit who reveals to us the truth? God the Father. Where can we learn the truth? From Jesus through God's Word. Who will help us to live the truth? The Holy Spirit. Our tracker challenges are intended for us to learn the books of the Old Testament. Remember, each word stands for a book of the Bible. Let's say them together. Challenge number one. God's empowering love never disappoints. God's stands for Genesis, the beginning. Empowering stands for Exodus, leaving the slavery of Egypt. Love stands for Leviticus. The law teaches us a holy way of life. Never stands for numbers. God divided Israel into tribes. How many tribes? Twelve. Disappoints stands for Deuteronomy. How to live faithfully in the land. Challenges number two, number three, and number four. Jesus, just redeemer sinless Savior, King of Kings, crucified Christ. Jesus, Joshua, arriving in the Promised Land. Just, Judges, the history of er Israel's early leaders. Redeemer, Ruth, the story of Ruth and redemption. Sinless, First Samuel, the history of Samuel, the prophet who listened to God. Savior, Second Samuel, the history of King David, the ancestor of Jesus. King of, First Kings, the kingdom splits into Israel and Judah. Kings, Second Kings, the history of good and bad kings. Crucified, First Chronicles, the history of King David continues. Christ, Second Chronicles, the legacy of the kings of Judah. Challenge number five, everyone needs empowering Jesus. Everyone stands for Ezra, the exiles return from Babylon. Needs stands for Nehemiah. Jerusalem's walls are rebuilt. Empowering stands for Esther, the courageous queen who helped at just the right time. Jesus stands for Job. Remain faithful to God even in hard times. Challenge number six, prayer, praise, every day. Prayer, the book of Psalms. Songs, prayers, and praises. Praise, the book of Proverbs. Wisdom is a treasure. Every day, the book of Ecclesiastes, the meaning of life. Challenge number seven. Serve in joy. Serve. Song of Solomon, a love story. In, 
Isaiah, restoring God's kingdom through the coming Messiah. Joy, Jeremiah, remain faithful to God even in hard times. Challenge number eight, love everyone. Love, the book of Lamentations. A book of sadness and renewed mercy. Everyone, the book of Ezekiel, a prophet for Israel during exile. Challenge number nine, desire holiness. What's it stand for? Desire stands for Daniel, delivery from evil and the lion's den. Holiness stands for Hosea, calling God's people to a life of faithfulness with God. Challenge number 10. What is it? Jesus always offers justice and mercy. What's it stand for? Jesus stands for Joel. Always stands for Amos. Offers stands for Obadiah. Justice stands for Jonah. And mercy stands for Micah. What's it all about? Joel. Restoration and blessing will come after repentance. Amos. A warning to unfaithful Israel. Obadiah. A judgment on the kingdom of Edom. Jonah, God's grace extends to everyone. Micah, judgment for sin and injustice. And our newest challenge is number 11. What is it? Never halt zeal. What's it stand for? Never stands for Nahum. Halt stands for Habakkuk. Zeal stands for Zephaniah. What's it all about? Nahum. God is both kind and stern. Habakkuk. The coming fall of Judah. Zephaniah. A warning to God's people. Today in Trackers, we're going to talk about what it means to be used in a constructive manner to glorify God. To begin, let's check in with our barn friends. Trackers of Truth! Featuring Duke and Luke, the Barn Brothers, Penny, the cold cracking tech savvy gal who is quick on her feet, Walker, the big-hearted handyman who uses his mechanical know-how to lend a helping hand. Jenny, the fun-loving biblical brains of the operation. And Milton, this super sassy swine has been fitted with the latest in animal communication technology. Join this crew of high-tech heroes as they sow truth, know truth, and grow truth. Trackers of Truth! Hey guys, what are you doing? We're repairing this barbed wire fence. Yep, not only were the cows getting out, but other animals were able to get in. Some are not safe for the cows to be around. That's right. We had no idea the damage was so bad. We should have repaired this a long time ago. I'm just thankful we're getting it done now. Me too. I would hate to lose any of our cows. Do you guys need any help? If you don't mind, you can hold the post while we attach the wire. We're almost done. By tonight, the cows will be safe and sound. You know, this reminds me of the story of Nehemiah. Oh, that's a great story. I recently learned about it at church. I guess you better tell us about it. Or you could show us the story. We all need a little break anyway. Let's, Let's go! go!
Esteemed leaders and residents of Jerusalem, listen! You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild this wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. Seeing them work makes me remember we have our own work to finish. Y'all ready to go? Listen, guys, let's rebuild this fence. If we all work together, we can finish before it gets too dark. Let's do it. Our story today is from the book of Nehemiah. Today we are going to learn about Nehemiah, the constructive tracker. Nehemiah was part of God's family. He loved God and loved the ways of God. But Nehemiah had been captured and he was in exile in another land. Most of God's people had also been captured and had been forced into service in the enemy's territory. Nehemiah had it good. He became a cupbearer to the king. It was a pretty prestigious position. He was in the presence of the king quite a bit. Of course, he usually just stood there, silently holding the royal cup for the king. Nehemiah didn't usually interact with the king, but he did his job and he did it well. Things were going well for Nehemiah. Everything was in a predictable routine and comfortable until Nehemiah had some visitors. These visitors had come from Jerusalem, his hometown. Jerusalem was a very special place. It had been the headquarters of God's people until the enemy had taken most of the people away. Nehemiah was very excited to hear news of Jerusalem. He asked many questions such as, how are our people who remained there? Have any of the exiles returned? How is the city now? The news that he heard broke his heart. His beloved city was in trouble. The visitors said to Nehemiah, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. This news made Nehemiah very sad. In fact, he sat right down and wept. You see, the wall around the city was a symbol of its strength and beauty. If the wall was broken down, that meant the city, that, that meant the enemies could easily enter the city. There was no protection left for the people who had survived the exile and had returned to the city. Without the wall, the city was destroyed. This made Nehemiah very sad, for Jerusalem wasn't just any old city. It was God's city for God's people. So what did Nehemiah do? He did four things. As I tell you what these four things are, I want you to hold up your hand according to the number we are on. Number one. Nehemiah mourned. That means he let his heart be touched by the condition of others. He wasn't just concerned about himself. He was concerned about other people and God's plan. Number two, he fasted. To fast means to give up something that is pleasing or helpful to you so you can seriously seek God's will. Nehemiah fasted from eating food. He basically gave up all the good things he liked to eat so he could seriously focus on what God was telling him. This gave him clarity, direction, and courage. Number three, he prayed. He turned to God and he praised him. He confessed his sins and the sins of his people and he asked God for help. 
Number four. He went to work. He did something about the needs he saw. He did not wait on someone else to do something. He did not make excuses about why he could not help. He went to work to do what he knew God was calling him to do. But it took courage, lots and lots of courage. The first thing he had to do was speak to the king, asking him for the freedom to leave the area, to take a break from his job as cupbearer and to go to Jerusalem to survey the damage. And to his great surprise, the king granted his request. When Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem, he was so sad to see the damage to his beautiful city. He knew God had called him to do something about it, but he knew he couldn't do it alone. First, he spent time surveying the damage. Then he began to talk to the people living in the city. He rallied the people and encouraged them to help him rebuild the wall. They had a lot to overcome. It's the same in our lives. Sometimes we ignore the needs around us. Sometimes we think that there is nothing that we can do to change things or help. But with God, we can. Let's see what we can learn from the story of Nehemiah and from the truth found in God's word. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 5 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We need to demolish our fear, doubt, and mean thoughts with the help of God's word, our prayers, and the Holy Spirit. Philippians 2, verse 5 says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. That meant he was close to the king, but in the position of servant. A servant does not usually ask the king for favors, but Nehemiah decided he must do something. We, needed, we need to decide how Jesus would think or act. And then we need to decide to do the same. Philippians 4, verse 8 says, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We need to demand that our thoughts and actions are true, honorable, right, and excellent. We need to determine who we are going to follow. We should determine to be a God follower instead of a crowd follower. Nehemiah traveled around the dilapidated wall. He examined every part. Then he shared his plan with the people. He said, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. The people had a choice when they heard Nehemiah's story. They could have continued to just accept that the wall was destroyed. They could have decided it was not their problem. They could have decided to remain uninvolved. But instead, they determined to do what they could. They said, let us start rebuilding. Romans 12, 22 
says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what, is God's, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So they began this good work together. They each just worked in the area around their own home, and they each contributed what they had, material things as well as their abilities and talents. At first, others made fun of them, but that did not stop them. Then some people got angry, but that did not stop them. They focused on what they needed to do, and they worked diligently in doing it. God blessed them for it. In only 52 days, they had completed the work. The wall was secure. They had each done what they could, and by working together, they completed the work. We can learn many good lessons from the story of Nehemiah. We can learn to help others, to pray, to work together. We can also learn to use our gifts and talents to help others and glorify God. I have some pieces of clay here. They don't all look like clay, but they all started from material that was something like this, just a lump of mud. Each one of these is shaped differently. These are kind of decorative, They're, but it's a little pot. This is a pot with some shapes on it. This is an apple, a blue apple. You've seen pots like this. They're made out of the same stuff. Like this one, made out of clay. In what way are these things similar? They're not all used for the same thing. They're not all the same size. But they are all made out of clay. Now, did the clay just happen to magically turn into what you see? No, of course not. Someone had to form the clay into the desired shape. Then when the shape was just right, it was put into a hot stove and cooked so it would be hard and stable enough to serve its purpose to hold something or to decorate a place. This bowl that these things are in was made out of clay too. It doesn't look like the others at all, does it? Isaiah 64, 8 says, yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. God is our creator. He made us all in his own image, meaning we represent him here on earth. Each one of us is unique and special. In fact, there are many verses in the Bible that tell us this, but I want us to look at just a couple. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. This verse shows that God created us so that even before we were born, God knew us and had a wonderful plan for each of us. And he wants us to be confident in the different ways that he made us. Different is good. 
that's the way he intended us to be unique each having a special purpose Ephesians 2 verse 10 says for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do another word to say handiwork is workmanship the Greek word for workmanship at workmanship actually can be translated something created God created you to be your unique self he loves who you are and who is continually forming you to be even more. He is not finished with you yet. He has made you to do good works and is transforming you to be more like Christ so you can accomplish all those good works he has planned for you to do. And he's never going to give up on you either. The Bible promises he will bring to completion the good work that he began in you. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for always listening and answering when we pray. Help us to learn to help others using our gifts and talents for your glory. Help us to understand that each person is valuable and unique with a special mission. In Jesus' name, Amen. Do good works. Hi, welcome back to Craft Time with Tava. Tonight we learned about Nehemiah to help us remember what Nehemiah and his people did. They rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem. We are making a brick wall out of crackers and chocolate frosting. Use frosting to make crackers stick together. How long or how tall can you make your wall of Jerusalem? Now here is my wall of Jerusalem. Thanks for watching. Bye. See you next week.